Hello, I'm Alex Sinclair. I'm an Executive Director and the Chief Scientific Officer at Invex Therapeutics. I work as a neurology doctor at Birmingham in the UK, where I run one of the world's largest clinics for patients with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. I also run a research group at the University of Birmingham. And over the last decade or so, we've been very much dedicated to looking for the underlying causes for idiopathic intracranial hypertension, as well as to bring through new treatments. I'm an elected member onto the International Headache Society Board, as well as the European Headache Federation Board. I also sit on the research committee for the North American Neuro-Ophthalmology Society, and I'm an active member more locally for the British Association for the Study of Headache. Together, these try to ensure that internationally and locally, we see advances in research and clinical care. And it's clear that there is an opening and growing need in the field to bring through therapies for idiopathic intracranial hypertension. I'm going to start by talking to you about um, our summary of the program that we've been running and a little bit about Invex Therapeutics. So Invex Therapeutics is a clinical stage drug development company targeting the orphan drug disease idiopathic intracranial hypertension. We are looking to repurpose exenatide as presendin, a new reformulation. We are looking to address a large and growing market for idiopathic intracranial hypertension with a total addressable market of up to 1.6 billion annually in the US and Europe. There is no regulatory cleared licensed drug available for patients with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Now we've obtained orphan drug designation both in the US and in Europe to provide expedited cost-effective drug development pathways as well as approval and registration and commercial exclusivity for up to 10 years. Now Invex expects the top line phase three data in the second half of 2023 and regulatory approval for Presendin in 2024. The data I'm presenting today strongly supports moving Presendin into a phase three clinical drug development program in the first half of 2021. We've met all of our primary endpoints and shown statistically significant improvements in some of our key secondary outcomes. This clear statistical and clinical evidence of efficacy in primary and secondary endpoints demonstrates a strong and sustained drug effect in the population of patients with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So I'd like to give a bit more background about the condition idiopathic intracranial hypertension. This is a condition which is a blinding disease and we have no licensed effective therapy. The incidence of this condition has been rising in line with the global epidemic of obesity, and we've seen a 350% increase over the last 10 years. So in countries where there are high obesity rates, we have a higher incidence of IIH. Now the hallmark of the disease is raised intracranial pressure, and the typical patient is a young female who is obese. And that is about 95% of the population. And young, I mean between puberty and running into menopause and often post-menopause. Now the problems for patients are twofold. The first significant risk is that of visual loss and we see 25% permanent blindness in these patients. But also for the patients themselves, they find that the long-term chronic disabling headaches is extremely debilitating and data has shown it has a significant impact on quality of life. These women have real difficulties with going to work, holding down a job, attending to childcare, doing the school run, for example. The patient advocacy groups and the IIH patients have spoken loud and clear. They published a, a document last year in the BMJ Open prioritizing what the top research priorities should be for, for idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And right there in the top 10 was a new therapy. So today we've taken a massive step forward, a step that hasn't been possible to make in the last 100 years since we've described this condition. And I'm delighted to share with you the trial results today. And this, this um, first slide is about the trial design and it, it really brings together that discovery science with some very innovative trial design to enable us to uh, successfully bring this to completion. So the trial itself was a, a double blind randomized placebo controlled trial where patients either receive placebo or exenatide through a subcutaneous injection twice a day. We enrolled 16 female patients between 18 and 60 and they had that confirmed diagnosis of IIH using 
the international guidelines for which I was a chair of the um, published documents. What was very um, specific and special about this trial was that we used real-time intracranial pressure monitoring, and I'm going to explain a bit more about that on my next slide. But what we really wanted to know was, with this trial was whether exenatide was able to significantly reduce intracranial pressure, because intracranial pressure is the hallmark of the disease. And we wanted to know whether that drug could do it very quickly, very early on. And then we also wanted to know whether the drug would have an enduring and chronic effect on these patients so that they could have their intracranial pressure controlled in the long term. We also included exploratory secondary outcomes, which looked at headache, as we know this is a key disabling feature of the disease, and also um, addressing vision changes, as we are concerned about that real risk of visual loss in these patients. So let's think about the intracranial pressure monitoring. So in my clinical practice, we tend to use lumbar punctures to diagnose the disease. And you know, there's been four randomized control trials conducted internationally um, ever in this condition, and I've run three of them. And we have done trials with lumbar puncture pressure monitoring. But the trouble with lumbar puncture pressure monitoring is it's highly variable and can be very inaccurate. So depending on things like the time of day, the position of the patient, the technique of the doctor, um, and a number of other factors, we can find that that reading can be highly variable. And so you would need a very, very large patient cohort if you were going to use lumbar punctures as a reference for your intracranial pressure. Plus, it's a very unpopular procedure with patients as it's very painful. So we consulted with patient groups and with our scientific committee, and we made a step forward for this trial and elected to use the actual brain pressure. Um, and we measured that using an intracranial pressure monitor so we wouldn't use the surrogate measure of, of lumbar puncture, we would actually measure brain pressure. And we use this in clinical practice as well. A little operation is done and a probe is placed into the brain to actually sample in real time the brain pressure beat to beat. And we use that sometimes for very poorly patients in our clinical practice, both in adult and pediatric practices. But it was a real um, novelty and a real advance to be able to use that in a research setting because what we're gonna be able to do with this trial then is to give the um, the drug that we want to test and we're going to be able to monitor very very much in real time changes in intracranial pressure both early on as well as chronically um, over a number of weeks and months of dosing. And what we do is we get the intracranial pressure monitor to read for 30 minutes continuously at baseline with the patients in a very standardized position and then we had the machine um, monitor the brain pressure continuously um, periodically during the trial. And we chose to do this at 2.5 hours, which is the peak plasma concentration, and then at 24 hours the next morning, and then at 12 weeks at the end of the trial. And in each 30 minute time um, interval, we're able to get over 9,000 data points because we can read data so rapidly at five hertz. So we can be very confident um, about the reliability of what we're measuring here. So what did the trial show? Well, this is the primary endpoint, and it shows intracranial pressure. So this is really, for me, the most important slide, the most important thing from the trial. We needed to know that this drug could indeed reduce intracranial pressure. And I was really delighted to see, first of all, if you look at, um, at the graphs A and B, you can see that very, very quickly, intracranial pressure comes down with the drug. So the, the drug can reduce intracranial pressure significantly at 2.5 hours by 18.6%, which is fantastic. And then again, we see that significant reduction of intracranial pressure at 24 hours by 20.8%. Then if you look at graph C, which is where we have dosed the patients continually over the three month period, we look at the 12 week time point and we again see that significant reduction in intracranial pressure. I'm going to move on to the next slide and here we're now looking at headache. So when we measure headache we have very much followed in line with how this is done through the International Headache Society guidelines that have been set for chronic migraine trials and I've done that because chronic migraine has a very similar phenotypic um, burden to patients with chronic IIH headaches and what's done is a monthly headache diary and we look at the monthly headache days i.e. how frequently the headaches are occurring. And what we saw was really pleasing. We saw a significant reduction um, within the patients that took exenatide at the 12 week time point. And actually that reduction was very marked. It was 7.7 .7 days. So to put this in perspective, a number of drugs have come through into clinical practice recently for chronic migraine. And I also run the headache services at my hospital. And these new drugs were 
um, came through FDA approval looking for a minimally important reduction in, in headache frequency of 1.5 to 2 days. So what we've seen here with a 7.7 .7 day reduction is, is really in excess of that and really very pleasing. And I think, you know, we're just reflecting that, that reduction in brain pressure that we've, um, that we've observed in the first slide. What's also interesting to note is the reduction in painkiller use, the analgesic days. Now, painkiller use is a real problem in IIH because we don't have a dedicated treatment. Unfortunately, the patients often turn to using over-the-counter medications and high use of opiates in particular, which can be really difficult. Now, it takes longer for patients to come off opiates and over-the-counter medications, but we're starting to see that really important trend down in the data. So for patients and clinicians, this is a really important outcome because patients are going to be wanting to use a drug that can improve their headaches as it's one of their key um, disabling factors. And next, I wanted to look at, at uh, the visual aspects. And here we're looking at visual acuity. There's an exemplar chart. We used a Logmar chart, which has the same amount of letters per line and is better for statistical analysis. And what we saw here was a, an improvement that was statistically significant. And we saw that improvement of a whole line on the visual acuity chart. So when patients can change by a whole line on a visual acuity chart, so for example, that might mean the, the difference between being able to drive or not, or the ability to do activities of daily living, computer work, etc. So again, a, a very clinically relevant result that we see here. And we just put up the individual patient data because again, it's a, it really helps to explain um, what's been going on. So if you look in blue, and I'll just hover the mouse, you can see that the trend down in the exenatide patients is very uniform with the exception of one. These patients have consistently a consistent result. Whereas in the placebo group over here in orangey red, there's very much scattering of data. So very reassuring to see that this drug can not only reduce the intracranial pressure, but we can have effects on the headache frequency and also on visual acuity. But this is an important slide because, as I've mentioned, patients with IIH have obesity. We certainly don't want a drug that would cause weight gain, as this would be very um, unpopular with patients, but also um, not a good thing to do in terms of exacerbating the disease. But we know that the class of drugs, the GLP-1 receptor agonists, tend to cause weight loss, but that's usually in the literature when, it's, when the drugs are taken in combination with a low calorie diet or a weight loss program. But we needed to know if our drug was working because of weight loss or because of that direct effect within the brain to reduce brain fluid production and reduce brain pressure, because that's what we'd shown in the preclinical data. And this is all very reassuring. Now, we, we know that the results of reduction in intracranial pressure at 2.5 hours and at 24 hours can't be due to weight loss because that's far too quick for patients to lose weight. So that's the first reassuring point. But then we needed to look at 12 weeks. And this graph shows us that there was no significant reduction in weight in either the placebo or the exenatide group. In fact, there was a slight trend for the placebo group to, to lose a little more. But Really, there was no significant changes in weight. And that's important because we know now that that significant reduction in intracranial pressure at 12 weeks was not due to weight loss. So how did the patients feel on this drug? So we had one serious adverse event, but that was in a patient on placebo group and completely unrelated. In terms of adverse events, the, the, the main one that we noted was nausea. We had three patients in the first 24 hours who had um, nausea necessitating an anti-nausea tablet to be taken and then four other patients had mild nausea mentioned during the trial but none of them needed to discontinue drug because of the nausea and they all completed the trial and didn't withdraw. We also had some minor wound infections from the placement of the monitor. So to put all this data in context it's really important a tolerable drug is really essential in this patient population the current drug, which is sometimes used off-label with very minimal efficacy, is acetazolamide. And we trialed that drug a number of years ago in a randomized controlled trial. And we found that at the end of that trial, only 48% of patients were able to continue on the drug um, because of the intolerable side effects. So that's really important because nobody withdrew from this drug. So I think we can, um, we can be very reassured that we have a much, uh, a much higher tolerable drug coming through here. I'm coming to the end now, but here's a, a, here's a slide on the baseline characteristics. And really, this is just telling us that it was a very classical, very typical IH population. They were young. They did have obesity. 
they did have significantly raised brain pressure when they were enrolled into the study. Um, and they also did have significant papilledema, which is that swelling of the back of the eye, which causes blindness and is, and is driven by the raised brain pressure. So to pull all of this together, you know, I, I, have, I saw patients really quite recently who have been coming through my clinics who have had really um, huge exacerbations of IIH when they present, they're coming in really poorly um, with, for example, reduced vision, sometimes hemorrhages at the back of the eye, that's bleeding at the back of the eye from the brain pressure. And we have very little in terms of an effective therapy that we can do. And these patients that have been coming through recently um, I can think of one that was very, very poorly that we've had to send for a surgical procedure to drain the brain fluid rapidly. And um, that's called a CSF shunt because we haven't got a, an effective therapy at the moment that could reverse that process. So I hope that in the future we will have new drugs coming through that are going to be able to help this, um, this patient group. I would emphasize that these drugs are not curative. Unfortunately, they will manage the symptoms, but they are not going to reverse the underlying condition. So patients will be on the drugs um, whilst they have the condition. Um, and really, in summary, our data supports moving Presendin through to a phase three clinical um, drug development program in the first half of 2021. We've met all of our primary outcomes. We had three of them, which is a big hurdle to come over. But I really wanted to know that the intracranial pressure would fall both early, you know, that there's acute measures that we saw, as well as um, at a prolonged time point after 12 week dosing. And we achieved all of that. And we've also seen relevant reductions in some of our secondaries for particularly headache and vision, which is really important. So the strength of these outcomes, so both the primary and the, those key clinical endpoints, imply a clear and strong drug effect in the IH population and support this progression to a single phase three clinical trial for registration in the US and in Europe. So I hope that's been a helpful and informative run through of our data and of the clinical background of these patients. Thank you very much for listening.